Welcome to Interplay, Conversations and Music. This is your host, Michael Shapiro, with a very dear friend and colleague and collaborator, Tim Fain, violinist extraordinaire. Nice to see you, Tim. It's good to see you, too. Tim is out in Montana. I'm here in Chappaqua, New York, as always. And I am thrilled to be with my one of my best friends. I have to say that. Somebody I love dearly and whose family I love, from your mom and dad down to your wife and your beautiful daughters. Um, Tim, we've known each other a long, long time. I first encountered you when Marge and I were at the Moab Music Festival, where we have a house. And we were, we were listening, I forget what string quartet it was. And we heard this first violin and we both looked at each other and said, who is that guy? You stood out think, in a... Was that, was that the performance with uh, Richard Daniel Poor was down there? I and, think it was them, yeah. It wasn't and, uh, one of his also, pieces. No, I think it was the, the Dvorak's um, piano quintet in A. Yes, was, was that's correct. Half. That's correct, which is uh, a piece I play was, on the piano. Yeah, yeah. It was a performance out there at the, um, at the Star Auditorium, I think, in Moab. Um, I'd had a, a nice hearty breakfast at the jailhouse. And, oh, uh, I know, jailhouse. you know, a good, good look at the Red, Red Mountains. And, and we went on stage to play that piece. And there was something magical about that. That evening, yeah, that was one of my first times down there at the festival. Yeah, that's right. But I, we were just totally floored. And after that, uh, I asked you to, to work with me, and you were, uh, you were we must have done four or five concerti together with the Chapel Orchestra. You were our um, you know, artist in residence one year and did every concert with us that we put yeah, on. Barber's Samuel Barber's Concerto. We oh, what Wilson, a my God! E minor Schindler's List, Brahms Double Concerto with Eddie Aaron. Mm -hmm. My God, what great stuff. And then you have one, two wonderful recordings of my music, my solo variations, piece variations, which you've recently have been playing again beautifully on the web and, and my second uh, violin piano sonata, which you recorded with That's Steve right. Beck. And now I've written a piece for you, which is quite large. It's a violin concerto at the shore of the sea. So hopefully when the lights come on again, we can go all over the world and you can premiere and play my, my beautiful, my beautiful, I'm going to say my beautiful violin concerto because I wrote it for you. <laughs> you can say that. Yeah, that, that works well for both of us. I think that helps. Hey, you know, the, at the short of the end, I will say one thing. I, I put on the cover, even before you've done it, I put Tim Fain editor. And why did I do that, Tim? What do you think I wrote editor on, your, on yours? What do you think? Well, you know, we're going to get to work on the piece and, and it, always, it always comes out a little different than I think either one of us would, would expect. You know, that's, that's the... the um, I think the real blessing uh, and the, the, um, just the, one of the, the really wonderful aspects of working with living composers and, um, and this collaboration with any, any other creator as you, um, you know, you pass this material back and forth. And, and at the end, you, uh, you know, one winds up with the piece of music that just feels like a perfect fit, you know, because everybody approaches their instrument in a different way. And I, uh, uh, it's a process by which we make um, a piece of music our own uh, before we go out and, and perform it. And I look forward to that, that process, uh, whether I'm working with, with you or Aaron Kernis or Philip Glass, it's, uh, it's a necessary and I think um, just a, a wonderful part of this collaboration. Well, it's quite true. And, you know, the wonderful thing about your collaboration with Philip Glass and the, duet, the duos you've done all over the world, I went to hear you, both of you at the Whitney Museum uh, play once. It was a very strange concert because you were all inside this kind of bubble and the people sitting around it could only hear you but not see you. And then I remember going into that bubble, it was covered in white. And I spoke to Philip about Chappaqua and he was thrilled to hear about Chappaqua, which was the first film he ever made called Chappaqua, <laughs> strangely enough. And it was only called that because he, somebody liked the title of Chappaqua. Now, it was not anything about my town. But Philip pointed to you. you. You didn't know this. And he pointed to you and he said, that guy, meaning Tim Fain, I can't believe how great he is. I just love playing with him. And my well, God. that's very... That's very, very sweet of him to say that. I remember when I, one of the first times we were playing together, I was, it was at Carnegie Hall and, and uh, we were doing a concert version of his work, Einstein on the Beach. And we had rehearsed the, the piece with Michael Reisman was, was kind of um, 
uh, master of ceremonies for the rehearsal and Philip and he right. were playing these doing keyboards. And there's a large movement in there that's just violin all by itself. And we would always skip it in rehearsals because, you know, we didn't want, want all the other players to sit around for five or six minutes waiting around while I played this thing through. And even in the dress rehearsal, Michael said, right, let's just skip it. And I looked at him like, are you sure? And he said, <laughs> yeah, look, we're, we're skipping this. The whole, the choir was there. And, and so the first time that they heard my, um, my interpretation of Me Play 2 from Einstein was in the concert. And, um, and I remember I started playing it. I, I do play it quite differently than, than any other violinist who've, who've played that piece. Um, for one, it's a bit faster in some sections. And Philip sort of turned, he adjusted his chair and sort of turned around with this perplexed look on his face, but kind of a, uh, and, and Michael looked, I think he, 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 he moved his pages as if he wasn't sure what I was playing. And after about a minute or so, Philip got this huge smile on his face <laughs> and Michael sort of looked like he had acquiesced to um, what I was doing. After the performance, Philip, came to me and he said, you know, there's, there's no going back now. <laughs> there's no going back. Yeah. I was at that performance. You were at that performance. Yeah. Oh, yes. As was your mom. And I met her backstage and I said, I've never heard it like that. And that was the best performance I've ever heard. It was thrilling to him. And, you know, well, for those who haven't heard like it. And, yeah. But there's, you, you have a wonderful YouTube uh, uh, version of that piece that you did in a duet concert with Philip. And it's called Neat Play Number Two. And folks, please search it out on, on YouTube to watch this remarkable performance of Phil Glass's music by Tim Fain, who is to me the greatest violinist in the world. I adore your work. So, well, we, we, we would play that together, and Philip would always um, just sit at the piano while I played it. I know. And I always I felt that very invigorating just to have him. Well, it's such a fine piece of music. Play it almost a yeah. hundred times. Yeah. It, well, whatever. It's such a fine piece of music. It's so well written. It's so path breaking and moving. I, I really think he outdid himself in that work. It's one of my favorite things by him. Now, the wonderful thing about Tim Fain, you know, you talk to violinists and they talk about playing this concerto or that concerto with that orchestra or this sonata with that pianist and that chamber concert or with. You have done it all. You have done everything. You have played solo, like in my piece variations, you have done duets like with Philip or Kreutzer Sonata, or you've done concerti, like the Barber you did with me, or all the other orchestras you work with, you know, the Bernstein Serenade, um, you name it, so many concerti. But you just don't limit yourself, I shouldn't say just, but you do not limit yourself only to what we would call standard playing. You have expanded your playing to encompass a lot of different areas. One area that's obvious to some of us who know your career is motion pictures. You had the incredible run for three years to play solo violin or violin with orchestra in three straight Oscar winners, Black Swan, Moonlight, and 12 Years a Slave. Th those featured Tim Fain on violin, three straight, um, the Black Swan was an unusual one because you actually appear on screen as well in that amazing film, right. by your, which was involving your friend, you know, Natalie Portman. Well, well if you pay attention, really pay attention, you'll see me in, uh, oh, five or six scenes, you know, where I'm thrashing about there on camera with the dancers yeah. circling around. Yeah. It was it was exhilarating to film uh, and so many friends from that uh, from that production, to, uh, so many people with whom I'm uh, remain friends. And uh, no, I know you do. Actually. Time but you've all, but we've also seen you on stage. I've been to appearances at the New York City Ballet, for example. I think it was an Nico Muley piece. You were up on stage playing. Isn't that right? And also uh, a piece by Daniel Ott. It was choreographed by Benjamin Milpier. That was actually shortly before um, he and Darren asked me to, to join forces with them for Black Swan. Um, uh, I've, I've worked extensively with, with Benjamin on, on multiple projects. And that was a piece called Double Aria. We did 
uh, we were all on stage. It was a pas de trois, you know. Uh, we were all on stage together, myself right. and two dancers, Asla yep. and Maria Karofsky. So that's the one I was at, actually, to correct myself. Mm -hmm. That's quite correct. But all right, so that's, that is only, uh, you know, we're talking about concerti, film, ballet. But there's been a lot of other immersive art that you've been involved in with people from other fields, not only dancers, but also people in uh, many of the creative arts, not only the plastic arts, but you're also getting involved in science. So can you talk a little bit about medicine and playing violin these days? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I, I first really took a deep dive into the intersection of music and emerging technology in a project that I worked on with Google, with YouTube. Director Jessica Brillhart approached me about uh, creating a film and that right. would be almost like a, a music video, uh, a performance video for a short work that I, I had composed back in 2015 for violin and orchestra called Resonance. Mm -hmm. And she, well, we, we, we kind of arrived at this idea of using music as a through mind, sort of connective tissue in a piece in virtual reality to help to massage, if you will, the, the viewer's experience uh, in quick cuts from place to place. Now, when you're in VR, in a headset, a cut is a much more, uh, is a, is a much more substantive, a substan uh, a substantive uh, event. Uh, it, it really involves a, um, taking you from one place and transporting you to another place because it's immersive in 180 or 360 degree experience. Um, this can be very jarring, uh, very confusing for our brains. Um, and our hope was that a uh, continuous thread of music would, would help. So I think, I think it works to some, to some degree. The final scene is, uh, you know, um, they're surrounded by a full orchestra in uh, Avatar Studios in New York City. And we said, well, let's get a full orchestra for the final scene. And because it was Google, uh, they said, why not? Let's do it. Um, and you see this evolution of this melody. Resonance is a loose theme and variations. Um, and in the space of three minutes, we wanted to take uh, take it from extremely intimate to um, just the full forces of a symphony orchestra, and then right back down to uh, to this intimacy, as if the entire thing had taken place in my imagination. So from it's there, I, I've worked yeah. on numerous projects. Uh, you know, VR, AR, uh, a project called Metamorphic was featured down at Sundance um, mm -hmm. this past festival. Um, well, actually, no. Well, the, the uh, it was it was just about exactly a year ago. Mm -hmm. uh, They're doing virtual uh, later this year in Jan and later this month in January. Um, and and I've 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 always I think been interested as as so many of us are in just what music can do, how how music can help us uh, to just gain insight and. Uh, within ourselves, or can can really help right. us heal, or can um, it's such a powerful tool. It can do so many things. And I, this past year, uh, twenty twenty, uh, I partnered with my friend Jacob Marshall, uh, rock and roll drummer and mm -hmm. pianist, um, along with Studio Elsewhere, and we began to create these recharge room spaces in hospitals where the health practitioners the nurses and doctors could go to experience a moment of relaxation and peace and literally recharge themselves you you, you know especially with with covid i uh, a nurse or a doctor to leave the hospital even just for a quick break involves so much um time Wasting yeah. a set of PPE um, yeah. equipment, uh, you can't just leave between uh, be when you're taking breaks, and you know sometimes 14-hour shifts in a day. That's crazy so stuff. There was really a problem um, right. at the front lines. Health practitioners really, really burning out and yep. losing uh, their focus, and that can be very dangerous, of course. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to create spaces for them, and we ended up using 
music, which Jacob and I have co-composed, um, scent, um, different sorts of sensory imagery on film, immersive experience, um, sound design, and um, potted plants. And really, it was, it was very inspiring to see how um, when there was a need uh, that we could very quickly, um, we were able to just kind of rewrite the rules of what was possible in an institution like that. We have, I think at this point, um, 12 different rooms across the Mount Sinai system in New York City. We're um, wow. launching into collaboration with Harvard and also with Yale and a couple other um, hospitals around the United States. So I'm really excited about that. We just released, we decided, Jacob and I decided to release actually one of the music that we've written together Mm -hmm. um for the public uh which we did on new year's new year's eve so Very you can nice. check that out if you want we go by the moniker embassy at e m b c that's embassy so that's uh is this on, on, on is that on our website or in your own website i mean it's on anywhere you listen to music spotify apple tune apple got it. itunes got uh, it. soundcloud youtube everywhere now, Tim, uh, it's, called, it's called Greenwood Butterflies. It's named as Greenwood much. Butterflies. Very nice. So we have to re check this out. While we're on uh, recreating, I want to talk about creating. Because one thing that's wonderful about Tim Fain is not only do you do these wonderful projects ac across many fields, but in recent years, you've been composing a lot more than I remember. Uh, so let's talk about some of your most recent pieces, because I think you've also written some pieces for violin and orchestra too recently, haven't you? That's right. Um, I have another short piece called Freedom, um, which I released as a charity single um, a few years back. Uh, and um, also a, a work called Glacial, which came out on Earth Day right. as a celebration of, of just planet and and i think there's a sort of an urgency in the in the music which maybe speaks to um, that's the one i'm familiar with it's quite good glacial oh, i appreciate that michael yeah. yeah and i just i've just finished up a uh, a full-length violin concerto actually as well um called edge oh, wow. of a dream which uh is going to be um the idea behind that is is uh bringing immersive technology and uh visuals into the concert hall so imagine that you get tickets to this gives a link to download an app for the show you get to the concert hall you get a little cardboard viewer stick your phone in uh, the lights go down the lights in your headset start to glow so you put it on and you see uh, uh, you know what's in, in the films and that goes dark and the action transfers to the stage and you have this oscillation uh, between mm -hmm. what is um, what is real and what is more ephemeral. I get a real kick out of um, just sort of uh, really sort of reframing what we know to be real uh, with what can be done uh, very convincingly in virtual well, let's hope it, Let's hope the technology works. I just have the great fear of, of Selma from Brooklyn who's going to scream in the middle of the thing, it's not working. <laughs> what are you going to do about you that know, on the stage? You may have to have helpers in like, the audience. I think like, you know, in these sorts of things, most likely the technology would be optional. You know, there would probably be Absolutely. some, I, I would want there to be some of the imagery projected in flat uh, behind right. the orchestra on a projection right. screen. You have to so there would that. be something for everybody. And, right. Um, right. you know, for those who did want to really push boundary of what was possible in a concert hall, uh, there would be a, a more full experience, I think. But there could be people who just want to, there's, it's always like this, you know, at, oh, you, yeah. people who oh, just yeah. want to close their eyes and, and sit back and, and take it all in, just listen to. Tim, I'm curious, I'm curious about composition. Because until Glacial, I, and I kind of knew this, but did not know it fully, uh, about your writing. How long have you been writing? Is this something you've been doing from the, from the beginning? Or is this picked up more recently? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I music was my first first language, you know, in terms of learning how to write and read. Um, I, I, knew, I knew about the notes and uh, before I knew how to read English. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's been, um, I think the ways in which I've composed have, have evolved. Um, mm -hmm. But throughout that, throughout the through line is that I 
I always, if I can, I almost always want to begin by writing out the notes by hand. It just, it feels um, like home to me. Whatever works. That's very works. much the case for this new violin concerto as well. You know, it's, uh, I, I look at, um, at the publishing stage, making things look pretty for me is something that I don't want to get into that until I'm pretty sure that I'm done because once it looks so pretty, why would you want to change something that looks so good? Even if you know that you need to get in there and revise some a passage well, you look at, you're, you're, so you're going nice, to, you know? well, I know that Tim, but wait a minute, you're going <laughs> to, you're going to, you're going to edit the hell out of my piece like you did the others. So my well, okay. It's different. I think it's maybe different when it's somebody else's. Um, oh, I see. It's coming <laughs> right. to coming to it with with, and this goes the same for me as well. You know, when I'm when I'm working on on a piece of music, I don't like to. I don't. I almost never like to master my own tracks. Send it to somebody else, even That's if sorry. I That's think sorry. I could do a good job. Um, yeah. I want I want a second set of ears. I want I want us. I want somebody to look at and to listen to it. Uh, and process it through their own experience. I think that's really important. It's a really important stage of, of creating. It's beautiful. I have a question for you, which I've been thinking about approaching 70 years old in my case, which I spoke to um, some of my mentors about also over the years past. And I've spoken to some people on this broadcast now several times, but I, I'm curious of your response because you have done a lot of different things including many things of mine. So without talking about my stuff, I'm just curious about generally, or even with specifics, what makes certain music last long-term and other pieces not? Have you given thought to that? I, I know what you're saying. And, and certainly there, there are works of art that have lasted. Um, sometimes it's the luck of the draw, sometimes the fashion of the day, uh, sometimes uh, there'll be a champion uh, later on down the line who will rediscover either uh, a composer, generally speaking, or uh, a work or subset of works within a composer's, a known composer's opus. I don't know. I, I have a sort of a different take on that. Maybe, Michael, I, I, I don't really think too much about it at all. I feel like, like, like if, I, if I'm worrying too much about what what I create or what, you know, this or that composer is creating that's going to last. I feel like it's already, um, if I'm focusing on what I think is going to make it last or what qualities will lead to that, I feel like I'm already looking at it through a lens that um, dates uh, the art in, in a certain way. I, I feel like that, like I, um, I don't, it's not that I don't necessarily feel qualified. I do feel qualified to, to, to see, and, and certainly my own personal preferences, what is really well constructed and what is effective and mm -hmm. what really moves me. Certainly, I mean, that, that is so um, clear and so important. But as far as what, what makes something last, I feel like if you're too concerned about that, your, your work is already, it's just gonna come out already feeling sort of, sort of dated, you know? Well, I'm not talking about the creator, all right? I wanna be clear, I'm not talking about the creator. The creator creates whatever the creator can do to the best of the creator's ability and training, knowledge, and all kinds of things, humanity, expression. And somebody told me just recently that the best pie the pieces that do last, quotes last, are the ones that are the best put together often. Uh, there's craft in there, a real deep craft. So not for the composer thinking, you know, you know what, am I, what am I writing is going to last. I mean, there have been some examples. When Sam Barber wrote the Adagio for strings. He said to Minotti, I really hit the jackpot on this one. He knew it, interestingly enough. And Elgar said the same thing to his wife after he was writing uh, parts of the Enigma variations. But I'm curious about, for you, because you do a lot of new music, do you get into a new piece and you say, this is ephemeral. Well, oh my God, this piece is eternal. Do you ever see that? Does that come to you from your perspective? No, it really doesn't. I, I, it, it, what, what occurs to me is I really love playing this and it speaks to me. Right. Or I feel so, so about it and it doesn't really speak to me. 
Um, and I, I, I think one can sort of assume maybe if something speaks to you as a performer, then you, it, it becomes this vessel, it becomes this means by which you can most effectively express yourself, you know? I'm not expressing Beethoven's feelings when I play his Sonata Number no. 10, violin and piano, I'm expressing my feelings. These are, when I read a story, I am, when I read Proust, I'm projecting my own experiences, my own story onto, onto what, what, what he wrote. Um, the, the story becomes this um, tool, becomes this yeah. way that I yeah. go deeper into myself. And in that, I can, I can feel that, um, that this will become something that people will also enjoy because they are seeing the volatility and, and the um, distillation of my own feelings coming through this piece. Uh, I think that's a beautiful way of saying because it. Because work music yeah. evokes something in me and brings out a side of me that, I, that, that, that communicates that would otherwise maybe lay dormant and wouldn't be expressed. Beautiful. You know, I, I, Tim, I can mention something specific and also I'm being selfish, but between the two of us, we can talk about these things of our common experience. You've recorded my second with Steve Bang, my second uh, violin piano sonata, and you performed it in L.A. That's as right. well at, at LACMA. Wonderful piece. Yeah. Yeah. The slow movement, which is, I think, one of the most moving things I've ever written. You gave it a special dimension and depth and profundity that I hoped for when I was writing it, but did not mm. completely hear. So I would venture to tell you that in Beethoven's 10th, when he wrote that Kreutzer Sonata, was he really thinking of how Tim Fain was gonna, gonna go, -um -bum, -um -bum. was he gonna think of the way you're gonna phrase that? Or those? Well, the, those, the those. slow movement of, of Sonata Number no. Nine, the Kreutzer. It's um, nine, or sorry, yeah. nine. Ten no, it's funny. Right, Both ten one. and and nine. Ten is almost there. There's Schubertian moments in that yeah. uh, piece. Throwback to. But you, you know, see what I'm saying? The way you phrase, the way you phrase something, the way you yeah, the way you phrase in something, the, the way you phrase something, is in, and the way you put it out there, and the way you're the pressure of your bow, or the way you you're pushing down on those strings with your vibrato. All of those elements, in your case, I know, having worked with you and seen you so many times, it comes from directly from your core. And if it's not coming from your core right away, you, you feel you've not given enough. I've seen that in you. You're not happy with yourself. And, but you mostly get there, which is the genius of your playing. So when I say when I heard you play either the Dvorak that, that night and I said to Marge, who is that guy? I heard a sound in that playing that I had never heard before. And then when we did the Barber or you did my Sonata or my variations, when you did uh, uh, Neat Play 2 at Carnegie for Phil, Phil's Einstein. I mean, I have never heard these kinds of things. So when you're talking about now, you're imparting something that the music is turning on something in you. To conclude our talk today, Talk about the moments that you want to seek going forward that would either in your own compositions or in the compositions of other people. Where's this going as you go older and become even more simple and complex at the same time? Well, uh, I do think that um... I'm very interested with uh, the way that um, I, I think two two things two uh, two things that that would be very much on opposite sides of the spectrum. One is very much looking to the past. Well, both deal with the future for for me, but in a sense, one is exploring possibilities of. A symphony orchestra, just an acoustic symphony orchestra. There's, right. um, there's so much that can be done with that, and I am 
just constantly uh, so enthralled and, and 